recording. Okay, cool. Yay. Everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today, I have Thomas R. Wilson on, who is someone I met at an autism resource fair, and it just sounded like he does the coolest things in the world and has a really cool job. And I actually remember telling you about my kid who is really into D&D and about an incident that occurred like where he got really upset like something happened in the campaign where it felt it wasn't fair and I was like how would you have handled that like you know because I feel like as a parent we're just like oh no my kid can't hack it like I just have to pull him out of the activity because he's going to be a disturbance for everyone else but you actually had a really great answer Let's put a pin in that. And I would love for you to introduce yourself and just say a little bit more about who you are and what you do. And then maybe we can circle back to that story. Definitely. So as stated, my name is Thomas R. Wilson, um, but I am an advocate uh, actually at the state level. I'm currently working with the Colorado government to work on accessibility mindsets. Um, I'm also a writer, uh, storyteller, game master, uh, business owner. Uh, at this point, I always like to joke, we don't have enough time for me to do go over everything I do because there's just so much, even with just being a business owner. But at the same time, um, I am someone who works within the neurodiverse community for the neurodiverse community. Um, I am, I didn't even know I was neurodiverse when I was younger. I feel like it wasn't a term that was regularly used um, in the 90s, early 2000s. At least I didn't hear it. Um, and I spent a lot of my life trying to figure out my own mental health needs, my own uh, neurodiverse needs, and dealing within that within a system that was so often trying to help me, but not really designed to help me. I was often labeled the problem child or the problem student, um, a mindset which I worked very hard to change and to make sure people don't use anymore. But going through those experiences, I learned a few key things. We all need to be built up. We all need to share our voice. And when we actually lead people through empathy and through compassion and a strength-based mindset, we can have radical changes uh, in our society and our programs and in our schools. And so that's a little bit about me. Oh my gosh. I love that. So I... Um... I'm curious to hear a little bit more about like your own journey around kind of discovering, like you said, your own needs and kind of your own neurodiversity. Like, I don't know, I know some people are kind of private about that information, but if you're willing to share, I'm curious. Definitely. Uh, so I grew up, um, I was born in the real 1990, the earliest 90s it can be. Um, and I actually, so when I was in, I think, first or second grade, I was tested uh, for my IQ. Uh, we found out that I had the IQ of a 40-year-old before I was 80, uh, eight years old. Um, I was excelling in school. I did have my problems, but um, we already knew that I had social anxiety and um, experiences around, you know, big groups of people. Uh, but I lost someone very near and dear to me when I was eight years old. It was my first substantial loss. And that's when my own mental health needs, my bipolar disorder kicked in. Um, and I hate to say it, but that mindset around me being the, you know, the best student possible very much changed. I learned very quickly that the school system I was in was not designed to work with people who had my needs. I also learned very quickly that when you are a youth, um, and I say youth to encapsulate, encapsulate a lot of ages, because I find when people hear kid, they automatically jump to a very negative mindset. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned when I, you're a youth and you're learning to navigate the realms of mental health um, and how to handle that, one of the things that's very hard to do is often say what you need to say uh, when you're dealing with rage issues or depression or anxiety. The brain just doesn't have that at that age. So as I got older, I learned how to write to express my feelings. I uh, entered into several programs, continued in school. Um, the common mentality, though, was that I was going to end up in jail, um, which was troubling for me because I've had 
Um, I knew people, even as a young kid, who were in and out of the prison systems. Um, but I continued to learn how flawed schools are in this country. I continued to learn how flawed certain programs are. I'm not going to name anything just out of respect for agencies that do do good work. Um, but then um, realistically through high school, that was very much a case. Senior year, I actually was the first person to graduate from a program um, that had ever been first person to graduate from that program through a high school here in Colorado. So that's pretty cool. Things were getting to change. Um, and then graduated college, something many of my teachers said I never would do. Um, and since then, my life has kind of been a series of defiances of people. I've always been that person who if someone tells me I can't do something, my natural response is, I watch me, I will do it. Um, and so when I got I was about in my mid twenties. I ended up in the healthcare system as a mentor. I've also worked as a reading tutor. Um, and then after about almost 10 years, I opened up my own business, RNH Creative Advocacy, utilizing the ideas that storytelling is not just really here because we like it. It's here because it coexists with humanity because it teaches us how to share our emotions. It teaches us how to connect to people and it teaches us that we don't necessarily have to believe that we're good at soaring, uh, storytelling. It teaches us that every day we tell stories. It helps us to understand our emotions, our mindsets, everything. And so in my work on a daily basis, I help people to lift up their voices. I challenge the perceptions of people with extra needs or lived experience of any kind are problematic. I work with a variety of communities that or in need, uh, like the LGBTQ+, the vision impaired, mental health, um, and I run a variety of programs based off of the knowledge of those experiences around the pain, the misery, the derogatory terms from people in authority, the hate that I got, the, per the bias that I received, and I've been able to change that into um, people tell you you can't, I'm going to help you do it. Or another way of saying it, um, helping people succeed and share their voice and tell their stories, not based on a derogatory mindset, but on a, we can really do anything as a society if we know how to perceive what we need, how to communicate it, and how we can better work together um, instead of working against one another. Oh my gosh. I love that. So I resonated with a lot of what you said, especially this like combination of social anxiety and giftedness. And like, I wouldn't, I mean, the word that's kind of coming to mind is like mutism or like selective mutism. But I think what you said is actually more accurate. It's just like a difficulty translating yourself for the world or like a, a difficulty with putting words um, out in a way that um, isn't kind of hijacked by, I don't know. I mean, I think it's so interesting because I think with neurodiversity, people do deal with kind of more intense emotions than maybe neurotypical people. Um, I feel like with neurodiversity, a lot of times you're dealing with a processing style that just isn't like as linear and as logical as like we would like to uphold as like the norm or is like, or, or what's best. So a lot of times you're dealing with just like impressions or some sort of a gestalt that that it's hard to kind of parse into language um yeah so similarly like I also as a kid was gifted and socially anxious and like much later had to translate that into oh I'm actually like neurodivergent <laughs> they're just like people were were not able to see that when I was younger because I'm also I'm a child of the 80s I'm 83 so I very much resonate um, okay, I want to talk about stories. Um, I love what you're saying about stories and storytelling. And I think for me, that does feel like something that very much got lost when we put science up on a pedestal. Like science very much likes to kind of break stuff down into like bits and pieces and it's very mechanistic. But I completely agree with you that storytelling is really magical and necessary in so many ways. Um, so 
I guess there's two questions I want to ask. So speaking of stories, I'm wondering if there is like a story that you want to tell about doing this work that for whatever reason feels like it's coming up for you to share, like something that was like a success or something that was, you know, like a personal accomplishment for you or like, you know, I don't know, like a D&D session that stood out for whatever reason. So that's my first question. And my second question is about me and stories, but we'll put a pin in that. Definitely. So I, oh goodness, there's so many stories that I could tell around that. Um, I always like to emphasize that my successes are not just mine, uh, especially with the community I work with. One of the things I don't want to do is necessarily give myself too much credit, um, just because I'm constantly working with youth, adults who are pushing themselves past their boundaries. But one in particular that um, I told recently to kind of emphasize this was um, I've, I've been running a game at the Autism Community Store for, I think, almost a couple of years now. And I've had so many returning, um, so many returning people. Uh, and there was a group, uh, two siblings came in and at first they didn't know if they would like it. Um, and they started showing up more and more. And I'm obviously trying to be like as friendly to their um, autonomy and anonymous kind of mindset. I don't want to give away info, any identifying information. Um, but about, I think maybe six, seven months in, uh, the younger sibling kept like uh, approaching me and was like so grateful to have a community space. And I was, I was so happy. Um, and I'm a big believer that like as a big guy when doing this work, I should never hug someone <laughs> just out of security uh, for myself, for transparency. And so right before Christmas, the younger sibling reached out to me, uh, wanted a hug. And I was like, I can't do hugs. And he just looked at, well, they looked at me and said, um, why? And I'm like, you know, I just got to be careful. And the mom heard it. it was like, oh, you know, some people don't like hugs. Um, and then after Christmas, they stopped by the next session, we ran the game, and the mom kind of flagged me down and, and the sibling, and then I turned around one more time, and the sibling was standing in front of me with a bag of Christmas presents oh. um, just for me. They had gone to Harry Potter World, they got me a chocolate wand, uh, they gave me a thank you card. And um, they also got me a $50 gift card. Um, the wand and everything was a lot. but And then in that moment, um, the youth looked at me and said, you're the best game master in the world. And said, I didn't know if I, I would like this, but the way that you treat everyone and the way that you honor all of our needs and make sure that everybody gets time in the game is awesome. You're the best game master ever. And then reached out for a hug. And despite all my rules, I was like, okay, this time I can give you a hug. And they squeezed me um, and said, thank you. Uh, and the mom was just beaming. And like, there are so many details that I haven't given just for the sake of their privacy. But that moment was one of those, like, that's going to stick with me forever kind of things. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think people like you are unfortunately quite unusual. Um, and I do think most people's experience is of being like pathologized or rejected or like alienated or made to feel wrong or bad in some way. Um and I don't doubt for a second that you have changed like numerous lives, not just this person's life. Um, so I guess maybe we can talk about me in just a little bit. We'll get to me eventually um, and storytelling. But I, I do kind of want to circle back to like the very first conversation that you and I had, which is where, you know, I was like, okay, like, so if there are like big feelings in the room or if there is conflict in the room, how do you, how do you deal with that? And you gave just like a, a really solid and, and sweet answer. And I was like, oh my God, because I feel like, again, that was really rare to hear. Would you like me to say it again? 
Yeah, I think I, yes. I realized there is a question in there. Do you remember what you told me? Like, I think I remember most of it. Um, and I may even say it without realizing. Yeah. Um, so the first thing is uh, staying calm. I'm a big believer that the moment the camp facilitator, the game facilitator, or whatever loses their temper, that is the moment when everything is going to go to chaos. Um, I don't think that means that you can't be upset or you can't be frustrated or stressed out. I, it just means honoring not just your own emotions, but the people at the table. Um, the second thing I would say is calmly and kindly calling out that behavior and working with the youth or whoever you work with, whatever age, to resolve that peacefully. Um, one thing I don't think I said last time, which I had this um, pointed out through some play I did with at a camp recently this year, which is something I think is really important is understanding the tone and mentality of that conflict. Um, I'm not someone who is often good at handling. Like, I don't like conflict around me, but I was at an event and there were teens working together at gameplay and constantly there were little conflicts that happened. And it was a reminder for me to step back and honor that conflict because it can also be a growing point in a friendship or a relationship. And the last thing, um, which I believe I said this when I saw you, was make sure that everybody feels valued um, and calm at the end. Just because there is conflict, good or bad, doesn't mean that a youth or an adult or someone, whatever age you want to call it, um, deserves to be kind of dug into the ground in that shame and that sorrow of what's happened. So making sure you can resolve it, make sure you're honoring it, making sure you're calm, but also not letting people leave that moment feeling like they've just been, you know, degraded or hurt. Um, it, there's so much power to, after a conflict, just validating and understanding and lifting someone up. Yeah. So the word that's coming to mind for me is dignity. And I think mm -hmm. our culture is so good at I think the word you used was degrading dignity or like ignoring dignity. And I think there is something to be said for like preserving and honoring everyone's like dignity. So they do feel respected. So something you said um, just a little bit ago about the way that you organize a D&D &D camp. Well, so, oh my God, I just have so many questions. Sorry. Um, so you do D&D &D campaigns. Um, do you do like any other type of like role playing or creative stuff or is it like primarily D and D or like, what are like the different types of like activities and crafts and things, storytelling things that you facilitate? So I actually do quite a lot. So I've done Dungeons and Dragons, which if you don't know, that's D and D. Yeah. Um, um, I've also done events like storytelling events uh two of the ones that have been really popular perhaps the most popular other than dungeon dragons has one that i created called stories meant for movement uh which the pre premise is pretty simple it's just active play and incorporating storytelling so the design of that is to have youth be presented with a prompt and then have them take over and if they want the story to be influenced by a spin or a twirl or a dance movement, um, that is it. And then we build off of those through different methods. In that, I have seen some kids absolutely, oh, some youth absolutely love it and they show up routinely. Um, I've also seen youth, like at one time we were at a place in a storming and someone told me the story of the storm through artwork. And it's really focused on just honoring that. I've also developed a program um, that I like to call Choose Your Own Adventure Storytime, which is very similar and modeled very much after those like Choose Your Own Adventure chapter books that used to exist, um, where you flip through the book, you read a part, and then you choose where you want to go. Um, I've also done other tabletop role-playing games. I've done other systems within that. I've done lectures and um, informational talks. I've done uh, events to help youth practice being a game master. Um, currently, I'm hoping to develop some, but I'm 
some more, but I'm also leading classes currently. I've, I've taught on Skillshare, on d and I'm hoping to develop a new course for uh, Udemy and, or Udemy, I don't know how that one's pronounced, um, and Skillshare by the end of this year. Um, and I've even done a lot of these uh, podcasty discussions, kind of emphasizing how stories don't have to be this compounded sitting in front of a table or hearing someone talk. But I will say in all of them, the main focus is making sure that I'm just, I'm not the only one heard. Um, and me even stepping back as much as I can, because as so many people know in this community, um, a lot of people like to strip people of their voice, especially their creative voice, mm-hmm. and like to take around, take out the idea of questions. Um, and that really frustrates me because I really do believe questions are a central pathway to power, which I believe is probably why many people um, confuse that with be- it being detrimental and wanting to eradicate that within certain communities. Yeah. Yeah. I think you just really spoke to like a a very particular disruptive experience for neurodiverse people, because I do think what I have experienced, especially with neurodivergent kiddos is like, they are so curious and a lot of their times, like their questioning is nonverbal. It's just, it looks like exploration. Mm -hmm. It looks like being like, what's this button or like this door is locked. Like, let me double check that. Um, but I think it's really interesting the connection that you made where we don't like questions because in this overculture, questions are perceived as a threat to power, um, which um, I, I just think speaks volumes. And that's like a whole other thing that we could talk about. Um, but let me let me come back to storytelling. Um, So it feels like storytelling is really a primary modality for you for like supporting and empowering people. And um, there is the connection to voice. Um, But so I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I know like I'm going through this experience right now where I'm like, oh, you know, like I know people respond better to stories. And like, even for me, there's stuff in like my human design where I'm supposed to be a storyteller. But like, I just feel so bad at telling stories. I feel like, I don't know, like I either get bogged down in the details or like I'm constantly being like, oh, wait, like I forgot this part. Like I have to tell you this part for this part to make sense. And um, I just, I I am wondering how you work with people who have a self-concept about like not being able to tell stories or like being a bad storyteller. So, I mean, the first thing I would say is I feel like the mindset of there are good storytellers and then bad storytellers is in and of itself kind of something that society has programmed into people, Um, especially like the idea of comparison. Like if you're not good at this, you can't get better. Um, And I run into a lot of people who have that worry and have that fear. Um, Again, because I feel like our society is so programmed to profit and worth over things. Um, So the first thing I try to do with most people is demonstrate how I would tell a story. Um, And then, but also one of the reasons I love D&D is it's a cooperative uh, storytelling aspect. There is so much back and forth and so much idea generation that eventually someone is going to have to give input. Um, And that's kind of why I built a lot of my model off of this is because I found if I ask a question someone can't answer, eventually that confidence will build. And that's another aspect to it is helping build confidence. That's why so much of my business model is built around strengths-based mindsets. Like, it's wild to me that this is kind of newer in a lot of things is the idea that strengths-based mindsets can help us overcome a lot. I'm not saying there is no moment where you can't have a negative or opinionated moment, but I find um, so many people are bogged down, even at like the age of eight, that they think they just can't do things. Um, 
So those are some core aspects. I will also say I am an extreme perfectionist um, and I am hyper critical of myself. Um, so constantly, even if I do an excellent job, my internal monologue is that I can do better. Um, or if I did really good, what can I do that's better than what I did last time? And so I definitely have those, those moments of like, oh my gosh, this was terrible. And six other people say it was great. And I think within that, that has built this mindset of empathy and it's built this mindset of, I can really understand why people think they're bad at something, mm -hmm. or I can understand why they're upset with this decision. And so incorporating those early elements of like strength-based mindset, building confidence, all of those from a realm of having, you know, not a true understanding because we can never fully understand something that is from another person's perspective based on psychology and how the brain processes and all these things. But we can build that confidence. I can help people feel stronger. And I will say over time, all of these elements help people to become better. And the final thing I would really emphasize is building confidence, all those things, but also giving people practice. Um, there are people who are natural storytellers, people who are gifted at talking, but I guarantee you none of them were born as good as they are now. Um, none of them had the mastery, none of them have it. Uh, there's a quote I love by Leonardo da Vinci, which I think it's by him. You have to be kind of wary of quotes nowadays, um, which is essentially, if people knew how hard I worked and have the mastery I have, then they would never value it. And that last part's a little bit of a, um, uh, paraphrasing but that's essentially the mindset um okay so I feel like there's a couple of things you said that just unlocks some stuff in me and the first well actually before I get into that just really quickly um can you just for people who may not be familiar with the phrase strengths based because I know mm -hmm. that's kind of like a neurodivergent community thing um, can you just say a little bit about what that is? Definitely. Um, and I'll do my best. So sometimes the simpler questions are the one that my own imposter syndrome makes me question my. Yeah, like there, um, different people define it differently. Just say your version. It's totally fine. It's not like we're defining it like medically and speaking for the whole community. Like, um, so uh, <laughs> my focus is really built around the idea of one, valuing the person and their efforts. So building this uh, system of feedback, the system of education around focusing on what someone does well, uh, encouraging that, fostering that, as well as focusing on the emphasis of how we can grow through that mindset. That doesn't necessarily mean that we can't um, give, we don't give compliments to everything. But what I found is when we have a focus on what someone can do and encourage them and positively foster the mindset that someone can do something, highlighting the capabilities, what they've done well, it really helps to develop one confidence, but also it helps to build the idea of someone, their strengths, what they can do. So to counteract that, I would say like negative mindset would be like telling someone only mentioning what they did wrong, not giving positive feedback, not giving room for growth, uh, not even just encouraging what they did do well. It's the best way I can examine it is like if you had a five year old and they kicked the ball, strength base would be you did great in this, this, and this. I would like to see you do this, but you can do you can do it. Let's work together. Let's foster this growth and let's make sure that you hold the confidence that you can do it. Whereas negative mindset would be negative reinforcement or all this would be essentially in my mind, you didn't kick the ball far enough. Your posture was bad. You're not going to succeed. Give up essentially. And there is nuance in both of these, but that's how I'd explain it best right off the cuff so 
I do feel like in some ways strengths based feels like really obvious and like just almost banal. And for me, I also feel like that kind of overshadows like how truly radical of an approach it actually is because the again the overculture is so like deficit focused and I feel like you know just reminiscing on my childhood and I don't know if yours was similar the stuff that we were good at was like great you know, like nothing was really said about it. It was just kind of accepted as a given. And then so much more like emphasis and dialogue and focus was given to like, you need to balance your flaws, you know, or you need to work on your weak points. Like that was kind of like, it was like, oh, cool. Like you're naturally great at this. Great. Like, you know, we'll just let that glide. But like over here, you know, like you really need to compensate for this. And like, this is where we're going to put like all of our attention, all of our attention. And it, um, it it really is like a deficit mindset where like you're not even allowed to like enjoy or celebrate your strengths because like all of your energy has to go into like strengthening your flaws or like you know like compensating for your flaws or like so I I actually think it's incredibly radical (laughs) to just be like hey like this is what you're good at like let's like spend time with that let's spend energy with that um And like, let's see how far that can get us before, you know, like we have to go into an area of like, oh, well, I'm like not naturally good at this, but like, you know, it's it's necessary for this particular project. So like now, because it's like a true real life need, like I am going to work on, you know, this, like, and uh, these words I realize are problematic, but you know, like this weakness of mine or like this place where I don't have like a lot of, um, natural talent or like inclination um so the I want to circle back to when you were talking about stories and like supporting someone who doesn't think that they're a good storyteller because that is me and I feel like the two things that came up for me is that storytelling is really facilitated by community like there's a way in which if you um don't think you're a good storyteller to be supported by community and to tell like community-based stories where like everyone is participating in the story um and I actually think maybe we have like a very western way of thinking about storytelling which is where like you know, I get the picture of like a classroom teacher who's reading a book and everyone's sitting in a circle around her and they have to be quiet and she's just reading the words on the page and like you're not allowed to interrupt until the end of the story and then maybe there's some time for questions. And then I think about when my partner tells my kids stories at bedtime, like they're constantly interrupting and influencing the story. You know, they're like, can you put like this character into it? Like, can this character do this? And like, um, So I do think of stories as like alive and evolving and and very community based. And that can take like a lot of pressure off the storyteller to tell like a perfect story or to tell like a polished story. Um, What was the other thing? Oh, the other thing you said is um, like drawing people's stories out of them I I put down like inviting a story and I think there's like a very big difference when like someone there's like a receptive audience or someone has asked you about something and they're like very curious and you can feel their genuine curiosity and then that invites like a very different type of story than when like you're not sure if people are interested you're not sure if people are listening like you haven't been invited to share your voice so I'd I just wanted to circle back to that because it actually was really helpful. And those are the two things that like personally helped me. So I don't know if that brings up anything for you, but if it doesn't, um, I can ask another question, but if you want to respond, please do. Well, I think the big one, and you really hit the nail on the head, which is a lot of people's idea of storytelling is that sitting, um, like having a teacher or facilitator in front of a book, people sitting in chairs, um, people listening to the story. And there's a few things that you want to highlight because I do think it is very Western. I think it's also 
very much the result of a series of circumstances within society, um, especially the expectations of youth. Um, and I'll break it down really slowly. But the first thing I want to mention is the expectations of youth. Um, I am, I've just started an educa education job with an organization. I've been teaching for a while of how people learn skills. And one of the main things I've learned is our expectations of youth in the West are wildly inefficient. Um, the idea of being in school for like six to eight hours, doing a ton of homework, doing this, uh, you have to sit or you're being disruptive mindset very much holds so many people back. Um, and then I also want to emphasize that by like for, you know, millennia, thousands of years, whatever anyone's religious or political leanings, um, human beings have for so long told stories around the fire. They have done it through dance, through myths, through lore. They've done it in communities. They've done it in lecture halls. There's been active participation. And I feel like the West's mindset of that is inefficient or that is hard to manage really, I feel like, tells more about the people telling stories than the people listening. Um there is so much, I'm not going to lie and say that it isn't hard work and it doesn't require lots of effort and prep time. But if we really look at things through the lens of the speaker saying, I don't like that this person is fidgeting in a chair or using a, um, a fidget toy. Um, that's a very different opinion than the person who may be sitting in the fidget chair using the fidget toy so they can focus so that they can do something like I literally did a class yesterday and my people had pen and paper out and they were drawing I'm sure taking notes from time to time and for a lot of people that would be seen as disruptive but what I said was if this helps you focus I do not mind and I cannot lie to you like that they spoke up and said, yes, this is really helpful to me. And I said, all right, let's keep it going then. And they both very politely said, thank you, and continued the draw. And I, I will tell you, there was success. Those youth did a great job on practicing their phonics. They did really well, and it helped them stay focused in a 45-minute class and one of them, when I was ready to take a break from something, even jumped up and said, let's do two to three more. I want to do more of this. Wow. And that response in and of itself is huge. And I very much value that from them. Yeah. Well, I mean, that reminds me too of like, speaking of like different processing styles and different brains. Um, there's so many people who process so much better when they are in movement. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think just, you know, not to like overgeneralize, but I think that we know with neuroscience that like a lot of times when you're taking in information, movement actually helps integrate it and move it from like short term into like longer term memory and like helps you make connections that you wouldn't if you were sitting still. So um, yes, I completely agree with you that there's many, many ways in which like the school system is divorced completely from like efficacy and also from like modern neuroscience. But again, like that's a whole other discussion. Um, but I, I completely resonate. Um, and I also think like the other thing that I want to add uh, about stories is that the West really separates the storyteller from the audience. Um, and, um, you know, like indigeneity or, or other ways of storytelling, like that doesn't necessarily happen. I think the last thing that I want to say, I was just thinking of like, we went to a theater production with my kids and my son is just very like slouchy and like slumpy. And is just like constantly like adjusting his posture. 
And I remember kind of being told as a kid that like your body language matters. Like if you're not sitting upright and attentively, then it's like rude. You know, like if you're slouching, you're conveying the message that like you're not interested or you're hostile or like you're rebellious. And I think, um, you know, like that is so not true. And actually like different body postures are also ways of like helping us focus, you know, Mm -hmm. and for like a lot of not neurodivergent folks, but folks in general, like holding the body in a particular posture that is socially acceptable is like so excruciating and so taxing that it actually does the opposite. And it takes away your focus because then all your energy is just going into like maintaining your body. So, um, can, so I actually, I went on this website, I forget what it was, but it was like a D&D website where people can sign up for you to be their dungeon master, or they can like send an invitation, you can accept it. Um, But I was just reading some of what you wrote on there and some of the reviews that people left for you. And um, I think one of the things that really stood out is that, because I imagine different dungeon masters and just, I guess for people who are not familiar with D&D, the dungeon master, I'm actually not super familiar myself, is the person who like kind of guides the game and like tells the game. Is that right? Is there anything yes, you want to add about that or? Yeah. That Okay. So um, it sounded like some of the things that people were saying is that you were really good about creating campaigns where like people of different skill levels could all still feel um, like really engaged and I think you wrote something about being like person first or like running person first campaigns. And so I'm just curious to hear more about like your personal style, but also kind of the strategies that you use to make the game as accessible and as inclusive for people as possible. So um, thank you for the compliments, by the way. Um, the first thing I would say, um, when I discuss person first campaigns or person first style, um, a lot of, having worked with the communities I work with, uh, it's very similar to the person centered mindset or someone that people are people, not their diagnosis or their lived experience. So when I run campaigns specifically with that focus, the first thing that I do, uh, especially if I market it as a neurodiverse friendly game, um, is acknowledging that Dungeons and Dragons and other tabletop role playing games are incredibly intricate and very complicated in a lot of ways. Um, I love the games. I always say that um, they were clearly designed from people within the neurodiverse community just not necessarily for the neurodiverse community. And that's something I really want to see a shift in, especially because there's so many books. There's so many different campaign settings and spells and monsters and things. And so often the phrasing is just not great. It's, It's not helpful. People have to reread it. So I often break down the rules to try to simplify them and make them work in a coherent, like more coherent manner for a lot of people. The other thing is emphasizing that there are, if there are going to be triggers that they are listed, that I avoid topics and experiences that people have trauma from, um, that I communicate and I am clear in what I expect, but what other people expect of me and what's actually going to be in the story. Um, I make sure that the sensory elements are calm. There's not loud music or jarring flashing lights um, that everyone has like a good tone. You might hear it occasionally in how I'm talking, but I work really hard to try to keep my voice at like an even calming temper for people, uh, tempo for people so that, you know, I don't yell last minute or I don't, scream at people or do voices that might be jarring um and all of that sounds like a lot i'm sure for some people and it is um but what i also work really hard to do is make sure each person feels valued uh they feel heard and by doing that i try very hard to um 
speaking of neurodiverse tendencies, I'm really bad at looking at people in the eyes. Like I'm, I'm good at seeing, like looking at people's heads or their clothes or something, but staring at someone in their eyes for a prolonged period is really hard for me. It's um, aggro. I don't know why. I really don't get it. I, I yes. don't either. <laughs> um, but I make sure people walk in, they're treated, my tone's good. They, if they want to incorporate ideas, they, I incorporate the ideas. Um, if there's something they want to change on their character sheet, they can change it on their character sheet. And all of it's really built into that idea that people are more than their diagnosis, more than their worries, and more than their stress, more than what they're dealing with in their life. Um, and creating an, and fostering an inclusive environment that understands that accessibility is more than just having a wheelchair ramp or a Zoom call. It's making sure you're honoring the emotional, mental, spiritual, uh, stress levels, all of these factors of what, uh, what and who a person is. So I am imagining that to be a game master that works the way that you do there needs to be like a certain amount of like attunement and flexibility and creativity um that maybe other dungeon masters don't have like where like mid game you might notice like someone feeling left out or like mid game you might notice that like someone you know was really excited to use like a particular spell but like a opportunity hasn't come up and you may need to like pivot more than other dungeon masters like am i imagining this correctly or like you you are imagining it correctly um even though i'm bad at looking at people's eyes i'm really good at picking up emotional and like physical cues from people so part of what I try really hard to do is pay attention to each person individually and watch for their reactions to things. And I will say, even though it's more complex, um, it is something a lot of people can learn how to do. One of my, like one of my big cries to the world is we need more people doing this work. Uh, we need more people trained, attuned to people getting this work done. Um, that being said, I would also say that no game master should ever have to go past their comfort zone in telling a story. But I feel like it's the same way for the players. You, no player should have to go through a story they're not interested in or experience a triggering situation. Um, and in all of that, especially picking up on the cues, the emotional tones, an important part of it is having the boundaries with myself and with my players to understand what they missed, what they want to do, and what I'm comfortable doing. Um, I I have heard this, I've heard two different versions of this one saying, which I love to say is, one, a boundary is a gift from for both myself and you. Um, the other is... Yes, boundaries are a gift to others, but they are incredibly important to us personally, first and foremost. Um, and I love both of those mentalities because proper boundaries will actually help us to better facilitate games, events, and so much more. Mm, yeah, let's talk about boundaries. So I am, um, I'm curious, one thing I'm curious about is I've heard you mention this a few times, this idea of making sure that everyone's needs feel met and like of ha just having that vocabulary in the conversation that like we have needs in the moment. Um, and a lot of times our needs in the moment is what is driving like our emotions or our voice or, you know, like how we're responding to a particular person. Um, so I'm curious to hear kind of your thought on the connection between needs and boundaries. And then I'm also curious to hear, again, maybe just like a personal story of like when you used a boundary successfully or when like you had an experience where you realized like a boundary was needed. Um, so definitely. Um, so to start, I think there is a very strong correlation between boundaries and needs. Um, I find often a lot of human behavior seems to be 
uh, for a lot of people seems to be a definition of this is my boundary. Um, please do not cross it. So like a lot of times when I work with youth, one of the things that I often witness and observe is if I say something or like someone is getting emotionally overwhelmed um, and they snap at me so often in my mindset, that is that individual saying, Hey, I'm stressed. This is too much. I need a change. And going back to conflict, I then address that and have, you know, take a pause moment, give that person that redirection, whether or not that's giving them the boundary of not having to participate for a moment, um, having that sensory step away moment. Um, and that's why I'm a huge believer that all behavior is communication. And everything I've said, I, I'm pretty sure I've said it well. But I'm going to be honest with you, I am not perfect at all of these skills. I am still learning each day. And I'll be honest with you, I often snap at family if I'm deeply overwhelmed or overly sensitive. Um, but even in that, that is my way of trying to communicate a need. And it's not necessarily a good thing, but through practice, we can get better at communicating our needs through our boundaries. Um, the other thing that I would say, um, a, an example of that uh, was real recently um, in a campaign, I had two players who had conflict. Um, they were getting annoyed with one another. One person wanted to try a spell. Another person wanted to try something else. One of those people said that that spell wouldn't work. The other person said, let the game master tell me. Um, and it almost sparked. Um, and in this moment, I acknowledge that something needed to be changed. So I said, okay, you both have difference of opinions. Let's roll the dice, see what happens. Right as they were getting ready to get the dice, I said, okay, you know, such and such. Your point is very valid. Normally this wouldn't work. And then I went to the other person and said, what did you roll? And they said, uh, they got a dice roll that wasn't high enough. And I said, okay. We can try it again next time, but this is how this is going to play out. I then established a moment of laughter, and within a couple moments, everyone was good. Um, I know that doesn't necessarily sound like some is like the biggest boundary, but that was me exercising my behavior to stay calm, but also the boundary of respectable players and demonstrating both behavior and how the problem could be resolved. By the end of that session, everyone had pretty much forgotten. There was no conversation about it. There was nothing. I gave them both a high five as they were leaving and they were happy. They were excited to be there next time. Um, and I very much view that as a success. I love that. So what is actually coming up for me isn't necessarily around boundaries, but I just want to speak it out loud because I think this story is clicking something into place for me around conflict that I've never articulated before. And your story is making a memory come up for me where just the other day, like my kids were in the car and they were arguing about a toy, like who got to have the toy. And it was just like this argument. And, um, then I remember like trying to intervene with the argument and like something happening that I don't remember, but then I, my next like kind of strong memory is of them in the same situation, like same toy, same car, just like completely different, just like cooperating, playing together. And, um, the, What's interesting is like the the middle piece, like how we got from like the first scenario to the second scenario, like isn't there for me. But I think the reason it's not there for me is that like a lot of times, again, in Western culture, we want things to be like very linear and go from like step one to step two, step three to step four, and like for everything to make sense. And what I'm beginning to realize about conflict, just listening to you talk and having that memory is that a lot of times there is kind of this like irrational piece around conflict or even just this kind of like luck piece or distraction piece that can look like anything that like 
you know, it's not like we talked things through, but like, it is really critical to resetting conflict. Like there's just this like really almost like mystical, like gear shift that can sometimes happen. That's really critical. And, and then it's like, whoa, everything's different. Like now, you know, we're, we're getting along. Um, so that's, that's what came up for me around conflict and yeah. So I don't know if you want to respond to that or move on to another question, but. Yeah, I will say, um, I think especially with youth, um, maybe if I uh, notice around like the age of like seven to 12, um, I think there is an irrational moment, but I think part of that anger um, is really um, adaptable. I feel like younger youth often have a better response to, and this may sound different to a lot of people, but I'll explain why, um, to like that ability to shift. And I think part of it is one, the age range and how uh, emotions are processed at that age. But I also think it's because like that, that reaction to something positive is so helpful because younger youth haven't been taught as much how to hold on to that anger yet like I notice a lot of teens they have a lot of hurt they have a lot of pain um it's kind of ingrained but we also like there's another great quote I love I think it's from George Lucas I just remember watching it on a Star Wars cartoon when I was younger which is hate isn't born it's taught and I feel like definitely as youth age up into like preteen and high school ages, um, that hate, that anger is taught so much more how to be held internally than when people are at a younger age. Um, and I think like the teaching of youth, how to resolve that through humor or like other healthy means is so much more palpable for younger kids, younger youth because they have that adaptability to them again I'm not a parent I'm always the person who shows up has fun then leaves like two hours later and then they're like looking forward to it for a week to like a month later so I have that going but that that's my own personal opinion of that scenario so you're saying that Part of it is just that they don't have like such an attachment to their anger and it just metabolizes a lot more naturally. Yeah. And I would say they also don't have that like bitterness to anger as much. Well, like the narrative around why they should be angry, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I know that you have to get going here pretty soon. So I think I want to ask, like, since you did just mention parents, um, you know, based on your work and on your like unique perspective, I'm curious, like what advice you might want to give to parents who have maybe neurodivergent kiddos around like helping kiddos develop their voice, um, helping kiddos develop their strengths or confidence and also, um, yeah, just how to incorporate more creativity, more stories. There's so much that I could say. Um, I love that question. So I would say, um, I know this is hard, especially because so many parents of youth that have neurodiversity or lived experience with it um, are so stigmatized by so much to society. Um, I mean, I, the thing that I commonly hear is too many people with neurodiversity are just on their tablet all day watching TV. Um, and then that bitterness from older adults or adults kind of gets carried into parents. So the first thing, two things I would say um, is honor the individuality of your youth by encouraging them to ask questions. But to emphasize that for parents in particular, give yourself a break. Like, I know the world is going to judge you. I know it's hard, but your youth is going to benefit from you, like, resting resetting your mind and not carrying the judgment of other people like I grew up um with a mom who has been single almost my entire life for it raised me and my sister and 
unfortunately, she got so much judgment shoved on her for our actions, for our own struggles with mental health and other things. And it really impacted a lot of memories that I had. Um, but the last thing I would really emphasize is whether it's in front of a TV, whether it's in, you know, studying, whatever, really have that time to foster creativity and passion and enjoyment. Um, if there's one thing I've learned through storytelling, through all of these events, it's that youth crave active play. They crave their passions. They crave their joy. And by honoring that, we can actually set up youth to be stronger and more confident going into the school system because we already know school systems are going to be hard on them. They're going to have bullies. They're going to, it's a lot of different scenarios, but making that home, that creative, safe space is really going to help them deter those negative emotions. Um, yeah, so... I love what you said. And I feel like, because I work with parents of neurodivergent kids as well. And I was also, uh, you know, a neurodivergent kid who is now an adult. And I, and I have a lot of like, you know, peers like yourself, for example, that are similar. And I will say that, you know, something that is really clear to me is like kids who were labeled like as troublemakers or like, didn't fit into the system for whatever reason when they were growing up and gave their parents a hard time and just had hard childhoods. Like, I don't want, again, don't want to overgeneralize, but I do find that these are people who grow up to do some of the most like heart centered work, some of the most creative work, some of the most needed work. And like, again, don't want to overgeneralize, but it feels pretty consistent. These are also the people who grow up and who are like the most empathetic and have a lot of like skills around like regular regulation and emotional literacy um so i i do feel like sometimes with neurodivergent kids it feels like when they're kids life is like a chaotic shit show but like it really is worth it it's almost like if i wanted to offer a metaphor like there's like a particular plant that is like requires like really intense conditions and really high maintenance to grow. But like the fruit that this plant bears is so much sweeter than just like your typical apple tree that doesn't need much pruning. So it kind of feels like that. It feels like you're not wrong. It is challenging to raise a child like this. Um, and also you're not doing anything wrong. It's totally worth it. And like, just wait until you see like what your child grows up to be. Um, so I don't know if you want to respond to that. And I, I have one more thought and then I'm just going to let you share how people can find you and let you go. Cause I know you need to go. Um, I will add to that one point. Um, one thing that I've had, I've seen, and a lot of people have seen this and I don't want to overgeneralize as well. Um, but we are having an influx of neurodiverse business owners and educators and program facilitators um, around the world that are actually serving their community because they know the work needs to be done. And that's actually one of the things that I'm really excited about for like Gen Z. Um, and I, I think it's Gen Alpha or whatever generation <laughs> is after that one. Um, is because, and I say this a lot, they are already so socially minded and so mental health minded and so like conscious about people in certain ways. And I want to be honest, no one is their best self at 17. Like it's just not going to happen. No one is their best self at 19. Like we all have growth. We all have these things we want to do. But those generations, I feel like, are really going to change a lot of things around mental health and education. And I am genuinely so excited to see it because so many, so much hard work has been done to get us to a point where these generations are minded in this way, like this conscious in this way. And I think, you know, there are going to be bad things that will happen, but there's, I think there's going to be a lot of good done because of it. Yeah, thank you for that hopeful note here at the very end. I don't know if you can see my little wasp friend. He's uh, just flew by. Um, I 
love that you're calling out progress. Um, I think at a time like this, it's so easy to, again, focus on like what's like the flaws, what's negative. And I love that you just gave a demonstration of how to be like a strength space mindset, even just about like culture and the world. So that's actually, I think, a really beautiful note to end on. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add or like follow up on um, around our conversation or anything that you wished I'd asked you that I didn't that you want to share. Um, well, speaking of one last note, um, I, I talked on this as I was going to be sharing base as well. Um, we need so many more people doing high quality work um, in Dungeons and Dragons, in neurodiverse education, all of these things. And um, if you're thinking about it and you want to do it, there, there are two things I'm going to say. One, this is not the work that you go into to become rich and famous. It's just not. Um, the other thing is, though, but if you want to make a positive impact on the world, you want to do something creative and fun and you want to get some fulfillment out of your life, I can't speak for everyone, but I'm sure there could be some people hearing this that may think that. It is some of the most rewarding, exciting, hard, but genuinely passion-filled work that I've ever done. I still work in healthcare. I still do a lot of things. But like, if I didn't love this work on the workload that I have, I would be done with it. And I think that in of itself is a testament to the value of working with these communities. Yeah, well, I think, you know, you mentioned enjoyment earlier. And again, I think the overculture has really um, divorced us. Like even mm -hmm. like, you know, things that we do for enjoyment, like need to have a purpose or like we immediately try to monetize them by becoming like an influence around it. Like there's you know, or like, oh, like you have to get all your work done before you can play. There's just so much around like minimizing or diminishing like enjoyment. Um, and, you know, I think most people have this idea that like you just work for the money and like you're supposed to hate your job just the way that you're supposed to hate school. <laughs> and, like, um, you know, so I think it's really important to you know, speaking of world building and like speaking of like putting dreams and like radical imaginings out there that like getting rich isn't the point but like enjoying your life is and that's very possible you, like you can enjoy your work and you can enjoy your life and you can have an enjoyable job that's like really um creative so yes thank you for like again like speaking that hope and speaking that world um into existence um do you want to share about how people can find you and work with you, like take your courses, all of that stuff? Definitely. So I am on Skillshare. Uh, I believe it's Thomas R. Wilson. I'll make sure everything that I mentioned is in a link tree link that I'll provide as well as all of these links. Awesome. Um, my website is RNH Creative Advocacy and Storytelling.net. Didn't realize how long of a URL that is oh, when I made notes. my web page. Yeah. Um, I am also, you are welcome to email me at nttrpg at gmail.com with any questions. Um, and the last thing that I will say is I am on LinkedIn as well. I haven't been as proactive in that as I would like to be lately, but I'm working on that. Um, but it'll be Thomas R. Wilson, RNH Creative Advocacy. Um, and also, if you just have questions or want to chat or want to know more about my work like I said I'm a massive believer in the power of questions so please reach out to me I'd love to have the conversation awesome okay well we'll throw all of that in the show notes I know that you got to run thank you so much this was such an inspiring and fun conversation and it yeah it was wonderful to hear from you thank you Hold on. I'm trying to figure out how to stop recording. Where is the recording button on this thing? Did it go away? Um, there it is. 